here this morning. Uh, we are very proud to have the Legion of Honor at Abdallah. We honor them as they honor all the veterans. Illustrious sir, sirs, divan, members all, we'd like to welcome you here today to join us, the Legion of Honor, in honoring our veterans on this memorial day. And at this particular point in time, I'd also like to introduce, who have I got back here? I don't have it written down. Vic Haney, our Grand Lodge rep. I'm slow today, what can I say? Rodeo and Derby got to us. And I want to thank all of you that devoted all of your time and effort to the Rodeo and the Demolition Derby this weekend, including the favorite and best part of us all, our ladies. And that having been said, at this particular point in time, I'd like to bring up a young man who was responsible for taking me into the Masonic world and getting me into the Shrine world. A very dear friend, past Grand Master, most worshipful John Mowen. In the years immediately following the end of the Civil War, an increasing number of memorial observances took place throughout the nation. Delegations of women from the North also visited cemeteries in the South, where Union soldiers were buried, and decorated their graves with flowers. Adjutant General Norton P. Chipman of the Grand Army of the Republic, the organization of Union veterans, realized that the nation was eager to honor those who had died in the fighting he suggested to General John A. Logan, who is a brother Mason, a member of Mitchell Lodge No. 85 in Western Illinois, who was then the Commander-in-Chief of the GAR, that arrangements be made for the organization to decorate the graves of Union soldiers on a uniform date throughout the country. General Logan approved the plan and issued an order to all Grand Army posts, and it read, the 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in the defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and Catholic churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form of ceremony is prescribed. The posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such fitting services and testimonies of respect as circumstances may permit. It is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hopes that it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He enlisted and desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country time for the simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective. And so, the first National Memorial Day on May 30th, 1868, was the occasion of more than 100 exercises honoring those who had died in the Civil War. The most noteworthy ceremonies of the day were held at the National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia, General Ulysses S. Grant was present at the services, and General James A. Garfield was the main speaker. This annual celebration of respect was known as Decoration Day until 1882, when the name was changed to Memorial Day. In 1971, a presidential proclamation took effect, stating that the last Monday in May would be observed as Memorial Day, and that it would be a legal holiday. General Logan's order 
stated, it is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. The last veteran of the Civil War died in 1959, and General Logan's hope had been fulfilled. We come together today 149 years after the issuance of General Logan's order to perpetuate that noble observance and to honor not only those who lost their lives in the Civil War, but in all conflicts since. General Logan, your order has been obeyed. The immortal Gettysburg Address was first given on November 19, 1863, by Abraham Lincoln at the dedication of the Civil War Cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Lincoln eloquently stated his grief for the fallen soldiers and the principles for which they had given their lives. This brief address, only 270 words long, is perhaps the most quoted speech of all time, but it bears repeating again and again until its message is heard and heeded by all. Lincoln said, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We are now engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far more than our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished task for which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we may take increased devotion to that noble cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I'm going to digress just a little bit. I'm going to give you my version of the tribute to the flag in honor of our commander, the Legion of Honor. Before you, you see the flag of the United States, properly flying at half-mast, to honor those before us. And on that beautiful waving piece you see red, white, and blue. The red stands for the blood given by those that allow us to be here today. In the trenches, on the hills, on the beaches, but that is their blood. The white stands for the honor and purity in the heart of every individual, man and woman, that came forth and stepped up for us, for this day, for our freedom, the purity found in each one of them and those of us that are still here to carry on their legacy. The blue, that's honor. That's the sky above us. That's what blankets us in the warmth of brotherhood and friendship. And some days the blue wasn't there. 
but they endured anyway and kept us all safe from harm. And the stars that you see, those are the states. That is the makeup of the United States of America, which they fought for, which we currently fight for, which we will stand for. That is the red, white, and blue, which we honor here today with our brothers. At this particular time, <clears throat> I'd like to call forward two gentlemen to give their thoughts and comments. Right Worshipful Jose Marrero, current Grand Marshal of Grand Lodge of the State of Kansas, and also Michael Kutch, a brother and friend. We spent a few times together uh, bringing new 32nd degree Masons. He is the Assistant Grand Tyler in the Grand Lodge of the State of Kansas. Brothers? I just heard a buck fast. <laughs> right Worshipful Hanky, please come forward. <laughs> it's uh, my honor to be here today to uh, bring you greetings from the most worshipful Cole Presley, the Grand Master of the Ancient Free Accept Masons of Kansas. Uh, it's our honor here to be here and partake this with you. I'd like to introduce some of the Grand Lodge members who are here. Most worshipful Jimmy Grassi. Most worshipful John Mallon, the golden voice. I can never match that voice. Thank you, Masters, for being here. Also, we have the Mike Cups, who is the what are you, Mike, now? Uh, assistant, grand. assistant Grand. I got this written down, okay. And Jose Marrero, who's the uh, also attending. We have Right Worshipful Mike Johnson, okay, who's the, you're Mike, you're the uh, deputy junior deacon. There we go. And also uh, Marvin Fletcher, who is the DDGM for 33. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our honor to be here, and for this day, uh, most of you guys, I recognize some of you with your hats, we've all crawled probably through the same mud, and you newer guys have eaten a lot of sand. Uh, one thing we don't see here today, I think, is our children. I see some children back there. I think what we have to do in our generation is don't let people forget the way society is now today uh, it has a tendency to orient on other things other than what we feel uh, makes this great nation great as we have a setting here i can probably go through our church and the 14 kids we have and ask them what that is they probably don't know what that is what that even stands for i'll have to admit uh, my daughters i raised two daughters uh, we went attended one of these in indiana because we always went back to the Indy 500 <coughs> here, and she was already in the fourth grade and says, Dad, what does that mean? So I think it's upon us to do not let this slip by because as we go and the society has a tendency to change, uh, let's not let them forget what it's all about. For this great nation that we have, we're so blessed, and it's blessed because people like you took up the mantle and served. Thank you. Well, now comes the fun part. No, many won't take it. I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker here today. Uh, huh. He's a fellow Marine. He served throughout the Pacific until he was separated from active duty in 1946. He was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 18th Marine Regiment, 2nd Marine Division. Well, as we all know, in the Marine Corps, we were nothing but 0311s, riflemen. That's what he was doing about that time until he got on Guadalcanal. <laughs> Following Guadalcanal, he 
was assigned to the engineers. He became one of my favorite guys, a flamethrower. He went on to serve in Tarawa, Saipan, the Tinian Islands. He's received two Purple Hearts. He was assigned the rank of Staff Sergeant. And oh, by the way, on March 20th of this year, he turned 18. Okay, so I'm lying. Max is the oldest and dearest member of a unit that I'm also proud to be part of, the Marine Corps League of the United States. And at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to my dear friend who replaced me as chaplain for the Marine Corps League, Max DeWeese. I'm not going to use this mic. Can you all hear me? I don't know what I was supposed to talk about today. When John called me a while back, he said, would you come and speak to us? And I really didn't know what to say, but there are two or three remarks I would like to make. First of all, we are a great republic because of the Revolutionary War back in the 17th something or another. But do you realize that only one third of the population at that time was in favor of getting freedom from the nation of England? Two thirds of our population at that time were opposed. We have progressed a long way, but no matter what the conflict has been over those years since then, there have always been those who have been opposed. I have no fault with them, because we are a free nation. There are many men and women who have given a great deal to give us that freedom that we enjoy today. It's very sad. <clears throat> I served on Guadalcanal. I was in the first company to land on Japanese soil. August 7th, 1942. He misspoke. Chihuahua, I was still a rifleman. So I paid attention and I was a stranger. If you don't know, Chihuahua was a small island, two and a half miles long, 500 yards wide at its widest part, defended by over 5,000 Japanese imperial said that we could not succeed. We would never take that out. It took the Marine Corps, 2nd Division, 76 hours. But we lost more men on Chihuahua in those 76 hours than we did in the six months in the campaign of Guadalcanal. And actually, more men were evacuated from Guadalcanal for malaria than they were for war. War is hell. So I'm going to go jump ahead a little bit and tell you why I think that it was one of the most merciful things that ever happened when President Truman recommended and insisted we drop the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. You may not know this, but at the time that it was done, plans had been drawn up to invade the southern island of Japan. The Japanese were ruled by their Emperor Hiroshito, who was their god. They were so brainwashed that everyone, women, little children, were armed either with a rifle, pistol, sword. Kids, most of them had bamboo spears that were sharpened to a deadly point. It is estimated, had we not, if we had to go in and make that invasion, which was planned and was going to happen, we would have lost over one, over 500,000 men. Think of how many were lost at the two atomic bombs and what would have happened to them. 
And that doesn't count how many Japanese would have lost their homes. So when you think about it, be glad that there are some things that you don't agree with that have happened and have made it possible for all of us to be here today. I have been honored to be on an honor flight to Washington, D.C. And I had a shirt given to me, and on the back of that shirt it said, if you can read this, thank a teacher. If you can read it in English, thank a veteran. I know, <clears throat> pardon me, I know that your program today will end with taps, but I would like to end my remarks with words that have been associated with taps. Days done, gone the sun, from the lake, from the hills, from the sky. All is well, safely rest, God is nigh. Fading light dims the sight, and the stars clean the sky, gleaming bright. From afar, from afar, drawing nigh, falls the night. Thanks and praise for the days, neath the sun, neath the stars, need the sky. As we go, this we know, God is mine. Thank you. I want to digress real quick before I do this. You know, I'm actually talking about Guadalcanal. He was second Marine Division, I was first Marine Division. And I don't know if most of you know what that was called. We were called the Walking Dead, and we have a whole lot of my brothers that are there. But I also forgot during my introductions, because I'm a little brain dead every once in a while, I would like to introduce the international commander of the Legion of Honor, Brother Morris Sykes. And now it's a privilege and honor for me to introduce somebody that uh, we haven't seen, but he's a lifetime member of the shrine. He's got this beautiful daughter sitting out here in the audience. And uh, let's see, behind every good man is a really good woman and an equally amazed father-in-law. <laughs> this man is a life member of the Abdallah Shrine. He's the father-in-law of illustrious Sir Don Best, and the father of Lady Linda Best. He served in July of 1944, or he entered in July of 1944, served until 1956. He was a member of the 42nd Infantry Division, which was known as the Rainbow Division, if some of you studied your history. He went to France, participated in the Battle of the Bulge, one of those funny things they made a movie about, but everybody didn't quite understand it. He was, when the force, he was with the forces that rescued Dachau, the concentration camp. And when he left the service, he left as a sergeant. And he's still a sergeant, as all of you are still the same rank and the same branch that you were ever in and will be continually for the rest of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. James Radford. You did a good job there. <laughs> uh, I would, I would uh, like to break the ice just a little bit here. I want to say <laughs> Uh, well, I was 
your shoulders and then he shook me up get your head above your shoulders and away we went and and we went on into Nuremberg and special thank you to our honored guests here today our speakers when I called them up and asked them to speak for us they said what's the pay I said coffee and donut and friendship and I think we uh, received a very good helping of that today anyway it's an honor to have them being World War II vets their voices are vanishing every day. So we will hear that the last World War II veteran has passed. 
So it was nice to have them here today to explain and also describe some of the experiences they went to. And we're thankful that they came. What we have here is the missing man table. To a veteran, it is a little tribute that we pay to those that have not come home. POWs and missing in action. The oath that every serviceman or woman takes upon entering the service. I repeat your name. You solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear truth, truth, truth and allegiance to the same. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. There is no expiration date on that oath. Veteran is someone who point in his or her life wrote a check payable to the United States of America for everything they owned, up to and including their life. That is the honor, and there are many people in this country who no longer understand that. We are compelled never to forget that we enjoy our daily pleasures. There are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. I call your attention to the small table, which occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. We call them comrades. They are not able to be with us and their loved ones today and their families. So join together and pay humble tribute to them and bear witness to the continued absence. It is our way of recognizing these members of our profession in arms missing from our midst, commonly known as MIA and POWs. We call them brothers. I'll explain the table. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions and respond to their country's call to arms so that their children may remain free. The lone lighted candle symbolizes the frailty of a single prisoner alone trying to stand against their oppressors. The black ribbon on the candle and the black cloth a reminder of the missing ones in the family and mourning for the comrades in arms to keep the faith and eagerly wait their return. The salt on the plate symbolizes the tears cried by the loved ones as they wait and hope. The slice of lemon on the bread plate reminds us of the bitter fate if we fail to bring them home. The Bible and flag represent the faith and sustain those who have been lost. The glass inverted signifying the POWs and MIAs cannot toast with us. The chair always empty to show that they are not with us today, but saved in the hopes that they will return home once again. The single red rose displayed in the vase serves as a reminder of the families and loved ones who keep the faith awaiting their return and also signifies the blood that they may have shed sacrifice to ensure freedom of the beloved United States of America. The red ribbon tied to the vase is joined with yellow, and as a reminder of the red and yellow ribbons worn on the lapels of the rest of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination and demand proper accounting of the missing servicemen and women. As you look upon a table, do not remember a ghost from the past, yet remember our comrades. Remember those who depend on us upon in battle. They now depend on us to bring them safely home. Remember our friend as they are ones we love, for they love life and freedom as much as we do. Please remember, for they may be gone, but not forgotten. May of all veterans please rise. Present arms for all those who fought for freedom and never returned. May they always be remembered. Order, arms. Please be seated. Thank you very much. They sat him down too soon, bro. Would all please rise? Sorry, Jim. At this time, dear brothers, and sisters all here in attendance with us. You've heard the story of the missing men. Let's not forget the missing women. And at this particular time, 
Let's give them the cry of honor. Present. Oh. Word.